Hi there, I'm Kathleen Jasper, and today we're talking about the Praxis Special Education Exams 5354 and 5545. Specifically, we're going to talk about the six principles of IDEA. If you understand these six principles of IDEA, you are better equipped to pass your exam because these six principles show up throughout the exams in many different ways on many different questions. Let's get started. Now, on all special education certification exams, you are gonna see some component of IDEA, which stands for Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It is a federal law that governs special education. Now, typically, education is left to the states and state policy. However, we do have some federal laws to protect students in all states, and IDEA is one of those federal laws. Now, the law is huge, and we're not gonna break down the entire law, but what we are going to break down are the six principles of IDEA because they are very important for you as a teacher, but also as you're answering questions on the exams. These principles are kind of intermingled throughout the test in the scenarios, in the answer choices, and all over. And if you understand these six principles, you're going to do better on the exam. So let's take a look at principle number one, free appropriate public education, also known as FAPE. There's a couple of important words here free and appropriate. Well, obviously free comes down to free public education. All students, regardless of race, gender, ability, whatever, ethnicity, religion, are all entitled to a free public education. That's one of the main things. It's, it's grounded in the 14th Amendment. But free, appropriate are the main words here, and appropriate is probably uh, the most important here. Why? Because it has to do with the way that we give students services in special education. So when we as teachers or school in general provide services to special education students, they must meet the state standards. Now. You know, if you've seen any of my videos, if you've read any of my books, you know that the state standards are up at the top of the list of importance because the state has outlined what it wants its students to be proficient in, and those are the state standards by grade level. Now, the way you might see this particular principle of IDEA on the exam is in answer choices, where you have an option to choose lowering the standards to meet the needs of the special education student. And I'm here to tell you that that is never, ever the right answer on this test or in life. We do not wanna lower the standards. The standards stay where they are supposed to be. What we want to do is help the student, accommodate the student with special needs to meet that standard. That is our job as teachers. And that goes for not just special education students, but students who are you know, below grade level or who need extra help. We need to accommodate, modify, whatever we have to do to help those students meet the standards, okay? So we always wanna keep standards high or where they're supposed to be. We never wanna lower them. So be on the lookout for those bad words that talk about lowering standards, making things easier. That type of language is typically not the right answer and it's grounded in this first principle here. Now we also have this one here. They must be designed to meet the unique needs of every student. Now that has to do with obviously our accommodations, differentiation, and scaffolding. Those are definitely on the good words list, right? And if you don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about good words, bad words, I'll link up a video here where we break down all the good words that you'll see on the exams and all the bad words to avoid on the exams. And it's a really awesome test strategy, so I will link that up for sure. But when we talk about the unique needs of each student, in a general education classroom, we're talking about, you know, this kid needs help in math, this one over here needs help in fluency in English, you know, you're differentiating based on skill. When we're talking about the special education classroom, you might have an array of exceptionalities in your classroom. In Florida, we call them exceptionalities. So you might have a student who has ADHD, you have to accommodate based on that student's exceptionality. You might also have a student over here who's bound to a wheelchair, However, she may be cognitively advanced. She might be really high in reading and math. So you have to challenge this student to keep her you know, from getting bored or whatever. Then you might have another student over here with an intellectual disability who needs help with functional skills. You have, might have another student over here with, uh, who's on the autism spectrum. Who, and, and that's called a spectrum for a reason because there's so many different ways in which those students present their disability. So, 
we want to make sure that we are accommodating and meeting the needs of each and every student. And it is very difficult, but as a special education teacher, that's your job. So that is part of the FAPE, free appropriate public education. You can't just stick a kid in, in special ed and give them worksheets and go, there you go. You know, that's not free appropriate. Appropriate means it meets the standards and it is differentiated and accommodated so that each student has his or her needs met. Then we have also in here, and this is important, you might get a question on this, these services continue even if they're suspended or expelled. Now, in some cases, special education students do have behavioral problems, and sometimes they will be suspended from school or expelled. Now, we have to be very careful that we do not expel or suspend students based on their disability, and that's where a manifestation hearing comes in. We're not gonna talk about that too much today, but it is a big part of special education. You can't just suspend kids for behavior problems because their behavior might be part of their disability. So we have to accommodate, not uh, expel or suspend. But in some cases, you may have students who are suspended who have disabilities. In that case, these services still are, are afforded to these students, even when they're suspended or expelled, okay? Very important. And then of course, these services must be outlined in the student's IEP or individual education plan, a huge part of special education. All right, so principle two of our six principles of IDEA is appropriate evaluation. Now, obviously, we don't just stick students in special ed, you know, based on like us thinking maybe they have a disability. There has to be proper evaluation going on. Now, just a quick tip here. Um, the evaluation is usually conducted, at least it's outlined this way on the exam, by a school psychologist. Um, usually, that's the correct answer when it comes to these evaluations, but there are several different types types of professionals who can perform an evaluation depending on the exceptionality of the student. All right, so within principle number two, appropriate evaluation, we have some more nuances here. So before being designated a student with a disability, evaluations must occur. And it's very important that evaluations encompass multiple measures, okay? Well, what does that mean? It means that you're not just using one test on one day to determine if a student has an exceptionality or a disability. We wanna make sure that we're using multiple measures in multiple situations so that when we come to this conclusion, we have exhausted everything. We don't ever, and this doesn't just go for students with disabilities, we don't ever want to you know, level a student based on one test on one day. Student could be having a bad day. It could be a poorly worded exam, whatever it is. So just in life in general, as a teacher, we don't wanna use just one measure for a student. We wanna use multiple measures, but definitely in terms of evaluations for special education, multiple measures should be used. The second thing is evaluation should be free from cultural bias. Well, you may say, well, of course, why would I be culturally biased? Well, a lot of times we don't even realize we're being culturally biased. In fact, for a while, many ELL students, English language learners, and students from other cultures were disproportionately represented in special education because they were struggling with the language. They didn't necessarily have a disability, so they were put in special education classes. Now, this doesn't happen as often now, but it still happens. So we need to be sure that we are assessing for a disability and that the assessments we are using are free from any kind of cultural bias that would put students at a disadvantage on these you know, evaluations. So be very careful of that. And we always want to check our cultural bias. We all have cultural bias, okay? All of us. Even I have cultural bias and I studied it you know, at length in many of my courses and I work really hard not to have it. We all have it. So understanding we have it and being cognizant of when it kind of filters in, we want to make sure we, you know, eliminate that as much as possible. Okay. The, the third bullet here is reevaluations must happen every three years unless the parent says we don't need to have a reevaluation. The reason being is that students might you know, uh, get better. They might grow out of certain disabilities, things like that. Not all disabilities, but they might end up, you know, advancing a little bit. And we make, we want to make sure we reevaluate just in case. We don't want to just keep somebody in special ed if they don't belong there, right? Now, in some instances, we may not want to reevaluate. If a student has cerebral palsy, um, the parent might say, you know what, we know that 
that she has cerebral palsy. It's hard for me to say that, cerebral palsy. And we're just gonna keep going in special education. Or they might want to have a reevaluation. It all depends. But it's every three years, unless the parents say, no, we're good, we're gonna keep going on the track we're going. Now, with that same thing in mind, a parent can re a request a reevaluation at any time. So let's say um, your student is put in special education and you as a parent are like, I don't believe that he needs to be there. I think he just has, you know, low reading scores or whatever. Well, you can ask for a reevaluation and that will be granted to you. So um, those are kind of the ways in which principle two will play out on the exam. Now, principle three of the six principles of IDEA has to do with the Individualized Education Program, also known as the IEP, the legal document for each student in special education. Now, there are certain things the IEP must include in order for it to be legally defensible. And that just basically means in order for it to be the legal document it's supposed to be. Now, first of all, the IEP must include measurable goals. So in this case, when you're on the exam and you see the term measure, measurable goals in the answer choice, it's probably going to be the correct answer or it's at least part of the good words, okay? Um, especially when we're talking about an IEP. It's arguably the most important part of the IEP. Now, these measurable goals will obviously change from year to year or at different times depending on what the student is doing. But it's very important that the student have goals outlined in the IEP and that you can measure them. It's very, very important. So they have to be things like, um, Jose will increase his reading comprehension by X amount of percent by using the STAR assessment, you know, being very specific on how you're going to measure these goals. You can't just say, Jose is gonna do better in school. That's not a measurable goal. It must be more specific than that. If it's a student with disabilities, let's say it's a student with an intellectual disability, the measurable goal might be something like, Sally will um, feed herself, you know, during lunch, most of the time, you know, just, really getting down deep into those measurable goals for the student um, and, the, and the parents so that they can see that. We also wanna make sure the IEP includes accommodations. Accommodations are the things that the teacher is going to do to accommodate the student. So if it's a visually impaired student, it might be larger print, it might be a screen reader on the computer, um, it might be that you know the student sits at the front of the room, that might be the simple accommodation there, or it could be more in depth. If it is a student with ADHD, maybe the accommodation is that the student gets to take frequent breaks or get up and, and walk to the back of the room when she's feeling antsy. Those are all accommodations that are documented in the IEP and the teacher must do those accommodations in the classroom. They're bound legally to do those accommodations in the classroom. So it's very, very important. And then the IEP must be reviewed every school year every year okay that's important you might get a question like that on the exam every year why because your goals don't stay the same year to year to year you want to have new goals obviously your goals in first grade are going to change to fifth grade sixth grade seventh grade so we always want to revisit that iep revise it with the team and make new measurable goals now principle four is one that you will see all over this exam in all kinds of questions and that is least restrictive environment lre and that basically means that we are going to make every attempt to educate students in special education with their non-disabled peers. What does that mean? That means inclusion, inclusion. These students should be out in the general education classes as much as possible, receiving the same education that everybody else is receiving. I remember when I was a kid, you know, a lot of times the special education kids were on another part of the school. We didn't see them much. And, you know, inclusion really wasn't a thing. Now it's very important that those students are in the culinary class with general education students, in PE, all of that. We want to make sure these kids are in general education classrooms. And we do that by supporting them and accommodating them to meet their specific needs. Now let's break down a little bit more of what LRE means. And I'm serious about this. Make sure you have on your LRE thinking cap when you are working through many of the questions on the exam because they are pervasive um, when it comes to all the different scenarios and things like that. These questions are all over the test. So LRE means, like I said before, every attempt must be made to educate special education students with their non-disabled peers. Like I mentioned about the student who is bound to the wheelchair who might be 
cognitively advanced. Well, we don't want to keep that student on the other side of the school in, you know, a life skills class, right? She needs to be in her advanced or AP class because that's where she is cognitively. So she needs to be in, you know, all of those regular general education classes with those students. So we need to make sure we're doing that. Uh, PE, culinary, all those extracurriculars, things like that. You're going to want to bring uh, your special education students in there. Now, also, special education students must receive meaningful access. What does that mean? Well, I just mentioned PE. This is probably the easiest way to talk about this, but we need to have, you know, ramps and, and access to PE equipment and allowing students to safely engage in physical education and other activities like that. Obviously, if a student is bound to her wheelchair, you're not gonna give her a 50 pound weight to lift, right, during weightlifting class. But there are other things we can do with that student and allow her to be part of the PE class. So that's very important. And here's another thing, special education students must be able to participate in extracurricular activities, sports, drama, art, all of that. This is access. LRE means access. And we should be giving these students all the same access that our general education students receive, but they might have a paraprofessional with them. They might have somebody else with them to assist, and that's okay, but access is key. Okay, so principle five of our six principles of IDEA is parent and student participation in the decision making. This is very, very important. We cannot have a system where the government and the schools just make decisions for parents and students. Parents and students must be at the table when these decisions are being made. It's their life, it's their family, it's their child, it's the student's own personal life. So it's very important that they are there to make these decisions with the team that's outlining you know, accommodations, services, things like that. Now, what does that mean in terms of, you know, students and parents being part of the decision-making process? Well, it means that they are part of the IEP team. And the most important person on the IEP team is going to be the student. This entire thing is for the student. The goals, the accommodations is for the special education student. So this is an awesome exercise in self-advocating, meaning I'm going to tell you what I need, I'm going to tell you what I want. We need to teach special education students to do that because once they leave high school, they're going to have to do that a lot on their own in life out there and also in post-secondary school. So for example, many of these services will transfer to students who go to college or community college, but the student will often have to stick up for him or herself and say, hey, I get these services based on my IEP. I need extra time or I need this. And Putting them on the IEP team and making sure they have a voice is the first step in teaching them how to advocate for themselves. And that goes along with later in their job opportunities and things like that. They have to be able to stand up for themselves and advocate for what they need. The next thing is transition planning. Now that starts at 14. Students begin transition planning at 14 and this is a big part of where they will go after high school. So it starts at 14, but by 16, a transition plan must be in place. So 14, it starts, by 16, we have a plan, okay? Now, in this transition plan, it might be that the student is preparing to go to college or post-secondary education. Okay, fine. Or training, some sort of trade school, something like that, fine. It might also mean that the student is transitioning to go into the workforce. It depends on the student's exceptionality. It depends on the student's desires. It depends on the student's goals. That's why the transition planning is so important. And it's even more important to have the student and parent there in on it because who am I to tell you what you need to do after high school? You need to advocate for yourself and tell us what you need. Okay, so that's very important. And then, of course, the review of the IEP. Students and parents must be part of that process because if something isn't working, they need to be able to stick up and say, I don't like this, this needs to be changed, or maybe something's working really, really well. And they can say, you know what, this worked so well last year, I wanna do it again this year. So those are really important aspects of the student and parent participation in the planning process. And finally, the sixth principle is procedural safeguards. Now, when we talk about this, we want to make sure we pay attention to parent and student rights, okay? That's what these questions have to do with. If you see the term procedural safeguards, you are talking about parent and student rights. Now, let's take a look at what that looks like more in depth 
When we talk about safeguards, we're talking about protection from students and parents in the process. Now, the evaluation process, there needs to be protections in place, making sure that parents have a say, students have a say. Um, that goes back into making sure things are not culturally biased. You know, we want to protect parents and students so we're not just throwing kids in special education who don't belong there and we need to be listening to parents and students, okay? Um, we also want to make sure that they are given notice of IEP meetings. Can't just have an IEP meeting without telling the parents. Sorry, that's not going to fly. Parents must be notified beforehand in writing. Usually something will go out in the mail because not everybody has access to internet and email and all of that. So we want to make sure we communicate with parents thoroughly. Also part of procedural safeguards, translators for parents who do not speak English. We cannot just assume that they're just going to figure out what we're talking about. If we know that somebody's parents do not speak English, we need to have a translator there who will be able to communicate what's going on in the IEP team meeting. Okay, We never want to leave a parent out. So that's very, very important. Another thing is parents have uh, access to education records. This goes along with FERPA. And this is the uh, Family Education Rights and Protection Act. That means that education records are confidential, for one, but parents and legal guardians and students have access to those records, okay? And that's a big part of special education. I want to see the records. What evaluation did you do? What was the score? What are my kids' grades? All of those things are part of procedural um, safeguards. And then, of course, due process, a very important term on this exam. Due process is about allowing parents and students to have a hearing based on decisions that were made for the parent or student. Let's say that the student is about to face suspension or expulsion, a due process hearing is necessary. And due process basically just means that we're hearing the student side of the story. We're able to kind of evaluate what's going on. It's not secretive, it's out there. And we have a chance to make the case for the student. A lawyer may be present during the due process hearing, an advocate may be present during the due process hearing, but due process is a good word on this exam. So so if you see it slow down, it might be the correct answer on the test. All right, so that brings us to the end of our six principles of IDEA. Remember, if you understand these six principles, you're gonna do better on your special education teacher certification exam. Um, we do have resources for this exam and I will link them up in the description below. Please make sure if you like this content that you subscribe to our YouTube channel, let your colleagues know that we're here and hit the notifications button so you're notified when we upload new content. Thank you so much for watching today and have an awesome day.